bless the Lord. This is your prayer pastor, Bishop Sean Teal. We're on live. It is 6.33 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Blessing and praising God for you and praising the Lord in advance for all who are about to join us or if you are watching this on demand, we are excited about you also and we know that tonight the Lord will give you a word or wherever you are in the world. Maybe it's the morning where you are and we're blessing and praising God. Of course, I have to appreciate all of the Liberian brothers and sisters who we left behind there in Monrovia, met so many across the 15 counties of that nation. It has been my honor, one of my highest honors to have spent time in Liberia. Thank you, Precious Prayer Everywhere Partners. Thank you for the most magnificent, miraculous members of any church this side of heaven. It is the house of prayer everywhere. You are living up to your name. You have become the hub. Uh, you are indeed the house. And I'm thanking and blessing and praising God for you. Prayer is our passion and everywhere is our mission. And I'm so glad that you are a part of the passion and the mission. We are, of course, on simulcast because it's Sunday night, Healing and Miracles Crusade Call. And I do have some testimonies tonight about some miracles, and we'll talk about those things. So why don't you go ahead and join me? Come on in, come on in and join me. And we're going to get ready to go uh, further into this word tonight. Uh, I know, let me check and make sure. We are on simulcast. I believe so. And so um, I'm going to wait. Praise the Lord. That is servant Carolyn Jacob. I know that voice anywhere. So she's on with us tonight. So you all come on in. Good to see you, Sister Brown. Blessing and praising God for you, Sister Ellington. Always thanking the Lord for you. Hey there, Sister Dylan. Blessing and praising the Lord for you, Pastor. Napoleon Butler is with us. That is a house of prayer everywhere, son. And of course, we're blessing and praising God for you. Go ahead and share if you can. Share if you can. Hey there, Brother Jordan. I see he's in tonight. Amen. The media team is on. Blessing and praising God for serving Kimberly MacArthur and all those who work on the media team. And did not we have an incredible telecast this morning? Blessing and praising God for each and every one who worked so diligently. And of course, a special shout out to Pastor Bryant Wyatt. Uh, that's uh, Well, he's a doctor too, but that's not the dad, that's the son. <laughs> People ask me, like, is that Pastor Bryant? Yeah, that's Pastor Wyatt, but that's Pastor Wyatt's son. And so that's my nephew and he's working with us and we're blessing and praising God for you. Hey there, Sister Taylor, minister. That's a word woman coming on in. We're blessing and praising the Lord for you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. I see you. Good evening. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Blessing and thanking the Lord for you. Yes, I see you there. I see you all the way from Atlanta. <laughs> I'm not going to call your name like I want to call your name, but I'm blessing and praising God for you, Sister Cheryl. Amen. Blessing and praising God for you, Servant Brenda Lawson. Thank you. Amen. I'm glad to be back and much love to you also. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. So we're getting atmosphere set. So go ahead and share, share and share. Get as many people through this portal as possible tonight. And then we're going to get into this word. Amen. Blessing and praising God for you. It's a wonderful privilege to be with you tonight. And I'm glad to be back. Amen. <clears throat> I'm glad to be back in the States. Uh, nowhere like the United States. Uh, we got our issues, though. Uh, but I tell you, uh, I learned so much and was blessed so bountifully while we were in Liberia. And again, all I can say to each and every one of you who sold and supported who invested and interceded, you helped to make it happen and we're able to do what God's called us to do because of precious people like you. Amen. Clarksville, Tennessee is in the house. I see you, Pastor Bobby. Amen. <laughs> I sure was going to say Suki. 
at least you knew that. Amen. Blessing and praise in the Lord for you. I love you. And good to see you on with us tonight. We go way back. Amen. And thanking the Lord for you. Amen. Come on in. Come on in. Let me make sure I'm on point. I think the recording has started and I'm still not on point. Let me know. Amen. Amen. Blessing and praising the Lord for you. Thank you, servant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the atmosphere that has been set. I'm unmuted. Gonna, amen. I'm unmuted. Amen. I need to be unmuted. Amen. Please unmute me. Glory to God. Uh, I want to get right into this word tonight, and then I'm going to share a testimony um, on the way out of our lesson, and I'm going to pray for you, and by the time I finish this teaching, and by the time I share that testimony, your faith level is going to be up, and whatever miracle you need tonight, whatever healing you're going to need tonight, I want you to believe that the Lord is going to meet you in the place of your need, and that tonight will be a night of the supernatural. There are signs and wonders and miracles that are to be done, should be done, can be done, and will be done for those who will do it according to your faith. In fact, I'm going to say it right now. According to your faith, be it done unto you. Let's get into this lesson. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. <clears throat> I'm only going to introduce this tonight I'll come back on um, Wednesday and we'll carry forth this lesson. And I'm doing my best with my voice tonight. Uh, just keep me lifted and the Lord will help me finish this lesson tonight, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter the 13th and verse 11. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Now, here's where I really want you to land on tonight. Three words. I will not get past these three words. Finally, brethren, farewell. Finally, brethren, farewell. I want you to see tonight that between the finally and the farewell, the Lord blesses the brethren. Between the finally and the farewell, the Lord blesses the brethren. I'm going to show it to you. Between the finally and the farewell, the Lord blesses the brethren. When the Lord gets ready to bless the brethren, it will be in that space between finally and farewell. Stay with me tonight. The Lord wants to bless the brethren, and I'll give clear definition on who those are, but the Lord wants to bless the brethren, and in order for the Lord to bless the brethren, he has to put the brethren between the finally and the farewell. Now, the word finally will parse out as three words. The word finally parses out as three words. The word finally is going to parse out as Furthermore, finally is furthermore. Finally is furthermore. Then the second word it parses out to is henceforth. Hence, H-E-N-C-E, forth. Henceforth. And then the third word that it parses out as is moreover. Moreover. So when you say finally, it's a Greek word, lupon. You don't have to remember that. But that Greek word lupon parses out as three different words, three different synonyms, three different concepts. It is number one, furthermore. If something is finally, it's furthermore. If something is finally, it is 
henceforth. If something is finally, it is more over. Are you with me? If it is finally in the biblical context, finally is not the end of anything. Not in the biblical context. Finally is simply going furthermore. It is going henceforth. It is going into the more over. When I say furthermore, what does that mean? It means that there is more further. That's all I got. <laughs> if it is furthermore, it means it is more further. So if I want something beyond where I am, I need to come to my finally. Because until I get to my finally, I'm not ready to go to furthermore. There's no more in my further. If you want to go beyond where you are right now, I need you to make a declaration out of your own mouth. Shout finally. Now, if you shouted it, when you text it, you got to use the exclamation point. Go ahead and post and just shout finally. Don't just write it, say it. Faith doesn't come by writing. Faith comes by hearing. Write it and then say it. Finally. Finally means I'm ready for my furthermore. Finally means I am ready for henceforth. What is henceforth? It means from here forward. It means from this point forward. So whatever has been in my past, I declare finally. And when I declare finally, it's an announcement to my atmosphere that I'm ready to move from where I've been. Say finally. Your atmosphere needs to hear you say finally. When you say finally, you are saying to everything around you, everything that is in your context, everything that is in your environment, that I'm ready to go henceforth. I've been here long enough. Now I'm ready to go forth and forth is always going forward. So what is it finally is furthermore. I need to go more and I need to go further in my more. How are you going to do that? Shout finally. And then there is the henceforth from here going forward. I'm moving ahead. Where does that start? It starts with you getting a mindset. It starts with you getting the confession out of your mouth. Finally, you're at your finally. I'm going to talk to somebody tonight who's at your finally. You have come to a critical point where you know you can't go back to what you used to be in. You know you're at a pivotal place in life. You're standing at that threshold of transformation and you refuse to rock back. When you know you can tip ahead and it's time for you to come to your tipping point. I need some leaders in the house to smile to do something with that. You can't, it's time to come to your tipping point. And when you're at your tipping point, it means you're ready for your furthermore. It means you're ready for your henceforth. And then you're ready for more over. Do you understand that even after God gives you more, he can over your more? What did you say, Bishop? I said the Lord can over your more. Even after you have more than you ever had, he can more your over. I mean, he can just bring more over you. He can bring more to you. The Lord is not through with you yet. Even if you are right now flossing like you never flossed before, even if your bank account is the best it's ever been and your family life is popping and you got peace of mind, hear what I'm telling you. The Lord says, even in that, there is some more over. Now, unto him that is able to do, exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. What kind of power is that? It's a finally power. If it can do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think, it means it can get me into my furthermore. It means that God has given me a power within that will take me henceforth. That means I have a power within me right now as a believer that can give me more over. There is some over for your more. And so when we think about the term finally, get it out of your head that finally is the end of anything. Finally is not the end of anything. Finally is the beginning of beyond. Put that in your notes. Finally is the beginning of beyond. Put it in your notes. Finally is the beginning of beyond. Put it in your notes. 
finally is the beginning of beyond. You're not ready to go beyond until you get the psychology of finally. You have to think like I'm ready to do more. You have to think like I'm ready to go ahead. You have to think like there is more that I can go to, that there is something ahead of me that I haven't been in. If you are satisfied where you are right now, just go ahead and find some other preacher to watch tonight because I don't have much for you. But what I do have is for those who are hungering and thirsting after a righteousness, for those who say, I got to have more, for those who would say, listen, what I have right now, I praise the Lord for it, no complaints, but I got to have more. And then there are some of us who are operating in the spirit realm and let's just tell the truth. We keep thinking, we keep it just keeps ringing in our spirits. There's got to be more. Am I talking to anybody? Is there anybody here tonight who would say there's got to be more? I mean, there's got to be more than the A and B selection. There's got to be more. There's got to be more than the next telecast. There's got to be more. There's got to be more than just getting some more prosperity and getting my body healed and speaking in tongues and having a good church service. There's got to be more. And if you're one of those people who are craving to go beyond, tonight is your night. The Holy Spirit's about to begin to build a lesson in you and through you that I believe is going to be blessed. Now, if you're on the house call with me, make sure that that phone you are on is muted. Now, watch this. Finally is furthermore. Finally is henceforth. Finally is moreover. Now, watch this. Get this in your notes. Finally is for the rest of the things that remain. Finally is for the rest of the things that remain. Finally is for the rest of the things that remain. What does that mean? It means that there are things that you have not entered into yet and they are sitting there waiting for you. Just sitting there waiting for you. But if you're not at your finally, then you don't want that which remains. There is more for you and it's just sitting there. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? That the Lord has treasures that are waiting for you on the other side of your finally. But the Lord has to wait for you to get to the point of your finally. So Joshua comes to uh, the Jordan. And at the Jordan, he comes to the point of his finally. And what does he do? He steps his foot in that river and the Jordan opens up. He came to a point of finally. And what does he do? He steps into it. And when he steps into it, what happens? Everything that was remaining. What was remaining? The promised land. Where was the promised land? Sitting where it always been sitting. The promised land, it was the same land that Moses sent the spies to. Joshua had seen the land before. Joshua knew that that land was there and he was not going to take no for an answer. He was going to get into the promise. And if you're going to get into the promises of God, you have to get a finally in your mind. You got to get a finally in your spirit. You got to be able to say, okay, enough is enough. All right, I've been here long enough. I want to do something different. I want to go beyond where I've been. I'm not going to settle to be in the same situation, in the same position that I'm in all of these years. You got to come to a finally. And when you come to the finally, that's when God says, all right, now I'm ready to give you that which remains. It's always been there. It's always been yours, but you haven't received it because you weren't ready for it. You were still saying, I'm good. And as long as you're saying I'm good in my situation, I don't need to grow in the things of God, you'll stay stuck right where you are. you got to say finally. Finally is for the rest of the things that remain. There's so much more for you, but you got to get a finally in your mind and in your spirit. Here's something else I want you to remember. Finally is for your future. Finally has nothing to do with your past. Finally is not a period on your past. Did you hear what I said? Finally is not a period on your past. We're not focused on your past. Finally does not focus on your past. Finally is focused on your future. So I want to ask you this. What are you right now focused on? 
Are you focused on your past or are you focused on your future? Are you watching what's walking away from you or are you looking for what God is bringing to you? Are you still lamenting and mourning over who's not in your life anymore, what you don't have in your life anymore, uh, the old house, the old car, the old boo, the old husband, the old wife, the old marriage, the old job? Are you still focused on that? Because that's what not what finally is about. Finally is not a period on your past. No, finally is the beginning of going beyond. You got to get the right focus. Let me show you something real quick. And I didn't plan on saying anything about this, but uh, I read this in my devotion and it blessed me because um, the Lord just gave me a new focus. I want to show you this to you. And it just, it just blessed me. Um, John chapter six, John chapter six, in John chapter six, Jesus is going to, um, feed the 5,000. Okay. That's the setup. But look at this, look at this, look at this. I'm in uh, verse two. I'm in verse two. And a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles, his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Listen to that. A great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Listen, Jesus did not have his eye on anyone else except the people that were on their way into the miracles. Did you hear what I said? Jesus knew that they were coming because they saw miracles and he also knew he was about to give them another one. They didn't know they were about to get a miracle that day. He knew because the Bible says he already knew what he was going to do. And the only reason he questioned those disciples is because he was going to test them. So what is, where is he focused? He's focused on the people that are in miracles. He's focused on the people who are about to experience miracles. And some of us need to really get to a finally, and particularly as it concerns people, because the people that God wants to bring in your life are going to be the people who are coming in for the supernatural. There is a miracle ministry on your life. You have super on your natural. You got extra on your ordinary. And you need to be thinking about not the people who don't want it, not the people who are not blessed by your ministry, not by the people who are not blessed by your anointing. You need to focus on the fact that God is bringing people into your life who understand miracles and who want miracles. That's exactly who Jesus saw coming to him. And you ought to see them coming to you too, because I can assure you they are on your way, eh? on their way to where you are. Glory to God. Let's go back. Second Corinthians chapter 13. So finally is not a period on my past. I'm not focused on my past. That's not my focus. My focus is fully on my future. Say focus on my future. Say it. Say, focus on my future. Say it, focus on my future. Say it, focus on my future. Now, if you're talking to yourself, focus on your future. That's where you need to be. Most people are living in the rear view mirror and that's why they keep crashing in life. You're not going to be able to succeed in life when you're always looking back. Looking back at your failures, looking back at your flaws, looking back at your problems, looking back at your predicaments. As long as you keep looking back, you'll be like Lot's wife. You'll wind up getting stuck right where you are. Isn't that what happened to her? She got turned into a pillar of salt. Why? Just kept on looking back. And the whole point was what? She got stuck in her present by focusing on her past. When she became a pillar of salt, she was stuck in her present. Why? Because she was focused on her past. Did you understand what I just said? Lot's wife. The reason she got stuck in her present is because she was focused on her past. If you keep focusing on your past, it doesn't just ruin your future. It'll stick you in your present. And see, some of us can't afford to stay in the present tense. We need to get into the future. Some of you right now watching me, listening to me, you don't want another month like you had last month. <laughs> 
Some of you don't want another day like you had today. You don't want to get stuck in your present. But if you don't want to get stuck in your present, you can't keep focusing on your past. Finally, is for the rest of the things because there's some more God has for you. Finally, is for your future. It has nothing to do with your past. And then get this, finally makes you ready for what is beyond where you are. Finally makes you ready for what is beyond where you are. If right now you think you can't reach it, say finally. If right now your resources won't let you buy it, say finally. If right now your degrees and your diplomas are not going to get you in that door, say finally. Because when you say finally, it will begin to align your life up. You just got to begin to believe in your heart and confess out of your mouth that God has more that there is something beyond where I am and I'm going to get what's beyond me. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, right now we're reading through the book of Acts. Did you know that? Are you reading through the book of Acts with us? Um, if not, we have the schedule posted right here on this same page. You need to find it. You need to share it. You need to save it. And every morning you should get up and read the book of Acts with us and then come on to the national prayer call. All that information is already available to you. You just have to be a seeker. If you're not a seeker, then you'll know you'll never find it. Now, here's what you know, that God has something beyond where you are. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He gives you power to go beyond yourself. Now, that was worth an offering right there. He gives you power to go beyond yourself. I need you to hear this. The Holy Spirit gives us finally power. <laughs> Say finally. The Holy Spirit gives us finally power. And what is finally power? It's the ability to go beyond yourself. How small are we when we're just being ourselves? How puny the thinking we have when we're just thinking on ourselves. How, how, how much minutiae must be in our lives when it's just about us. The only person in the world that can pull you beyond yourself, prod you and push you beyond yourself, empower you to do more than you ever could do. He is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to go beyond yourself. And that's why the Lord said, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You're about to be something you've never been before. And you're going to go places that you've never been before. You're going into Judea. You're going in Samaria. You're going to touch the uttermost parts of the earth. How is that possible? I'm giving you power that lets you go beyond. They had never been beyond Jerusalem. They had been to a few cities in Judea. They hadn't gone all the way through Judea. They sure hadn't spent much time in Samaria. You know how they acted the last time they were in Samaria. And you know they had gone nowhere near the uttermost parts of the earth. But when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them, what is he enabled to do? Enables them to go beyond themselves. Oh, I pray that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, I pray that you receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost and you will lay claim to the very experience that you read in Acts chapter two, because only then do you have the power to think beyond yourself, feel beyond yourself, reach beyond yourself, empower beyond yourself, purchase beyond yourself, bless beyond yourself. All of the things that are beyond you can only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is the exceeding, the abundantly, the above all that you could ask or think that's working in you. Yes. Somebody say yes. If you understand what I said, say yes. All right, you got that. So we need to say finally. Say it again. Finally. Now notice, there is finally, brethren, and then there's farewell. I just talked to you about the finally. Let me say something to you about the farewell. Get this in your notes. The Greek word here for farewell means to develop well. Farewell, like welfare. To develop well. Finally, 
Go beyond where you are right now. Why? Because I want you to develop well. The blessing of the brethren is somewhere between the finally and the farewell. What is God's destiny for you? For you to develop well. Now hear me, and I say this with all love, not a criticism at all, just an observation. Most believers are not developing well. I said it. Most believers are not developing well. The Lord wants the brethren to develop well. What does that mean? It means that your discipleship has some protocols and some disciplines. Develop well. It means that every day of your life, you're somewhere in the word, somewhere in prayer. Develop well. It means fasting and giving is a part of your regimen. Develop well. It means your speech and your conduct and your temperament is taking on the Christ-like character. Develop well. Paul says in Galatians 4, 19, I travail again. It's like I'm birthing y'all all over again and I'm travailing until Christ be formed in you. Paul understood what was going on with the Galatians and all the modern Galatians that are still on Facebook tonight. We need to develop well. You're not going to develop well if you don't submit to spiritual leadership. You won't develop well outside of congregational life. You're not going to develop well if you don't have a shepherd covering and watching over your soul. You're not going to develop well if you're not in obedience. You're not going to develop well if order is not a part of your increase. You're not going to develop well. The Lord wants you to develop well. And in order to develop well, it means he had to take you through some processes. In order for you to develop well, it means he's going to have to let some things happen in your life that you really didn't want to happen. And you think about that. Don't you right now tonight, I'm just about two or three of us, can you right now appreciate some of the hardship that you went through because you see it was God using it to develop you well? That wasn't for everybody. I thought I'd find somebody. There are some of you here tonight who can testify. I'm glad I went through it. It was ugly, but I'm glad I went through it. It hurt me to the core, but I'm glad I went through it. Oh, I couldn't talk about it for weeks, but I'm glad I went through it. I kept it as a secret down on the inside, and I was ashamed to even talk about it. But now when I look back at it, I thank the Lord that I had to go through it because going through it, what did it do? It developed you well. You'll never be developed well if the only thing you have are sugar sticks. What does the uh, ancient era proverb say? All sunshine makes a desert. <laughs> I'll say that again. All sunshine makes a desert. And I know there's some people, all they want is sunshine, no rainy days. But hear me, if you have all sunshine and no rainy days, you won't develop well. And I don't mean any harm, but some of us know people, they didn't develop well. That's why they're brats now. I don't mean brats. You know what I mean. I'm not saying that in a critical way. I'm just saying it in a way that you understand it. Grown brats. Just if grown brats. And you know, all right, so what happened? Somebody you want to ask them, how long you been like this? <laughs> because you can tell they did not develop well. But for whatever the Lord brought you through, I want you right now to thank him. Because whatever he took you through, it was for your development. Now, I'm going to date myself, but do you all remember uh, when they used to have um, um, the little Kodak huts, the Kodak shops? Um, let me see if I can describe them. In little plazas, they would have these little booths. And um, I, I don't know what else to call them, but Kodak shacks. And you would go there. And you would drop off your film. Back then they had film. Wasn't nothing digital. It was film. And you would drop off the film to one of these um, Kodak shacks. And then what they would do, they would take that film and put it in a dark room. And in the dark room, they were able to develop the picture. You could not develop the picture unless you were in the dark room. You couldn't develop it on yourself. You couldn't develop it yourself. You had to hand it over. 
then they would take it into the dark room and then they would develop it for you and then present it back to you. Well, the Lord does that with your life. The Lord takes all the stuff that you think was the worst stuff in your life. And what does he do? He takes it from you. What a grace. And not only does he take it from you, he'll then put it in a dark place. <laughs> and while you're in that dark room, in that dark place, and you thinking the Lord didn't do anything, you know what he's doing? He's developing your life. Somebody ought to praise God for the days that he put you in the dark rooms, for the days that your vision was in a dark room, for the days that your character and your reputation had to go into a dark room. Because look what the Lord has done through that season and through those situations. What has he done? He has developed you. The Lord wants you to fare well. He wants you to develop well, not arrive overnight, not to be a shooting star because there's a difference between a shining star and a shooting star. And in the world, they make shooting stars. The Lord has no interest in you becoming a shooting star. The Lord wants you to be a shining star. Daniel 12 and 3, the Lord said he wants his stars to shine. And he was talking about you. You are to be a shining star. And sometimes you won't get as much attention as a shooting star. But when it's all said and done, that shooting star is a gas ball burning out. And what do you have in the other stars? You have in the other stars, those that have been developed and developed to stay right there. Not a lot of attention, but they're always there. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. He says farewell. It means to develop well. It also means to thrive. It means to thrive. It means to thrive. Now, let me tell you something about thriving. You cannot thrive unless there is success despite circumstances. If someone is thriving, it means they survived because you can't thrive until you survived. And what did they survive? They survived despite their circumstances. So when the Lord says farewell to the brethren, he's saying, I want you to develop well. I want you to thrive. What do I want? I want you to have success despite the circumstances. Say success. Say it. You haven't said that word in a while. Say it. Success. It's for you. God has a schedule on your life. Success. And what should you be thinking about in success? I got to do this despite the circumstances. I'm going to thrive. Somebody say thrive. Somebody say thrive. In order to thrive, in order to develop well, in order to fare well, in order to have the best kind of welfare, you're going to have to succeed despite the circumstance. All right, nobody's picking you up. You still got to succeed. All right, nobody's returning your phone calls. You still have to succeed. Okay, they didn't hire you on that job. You still have to succeed. Okay, you're still not married in your 40s. Okay, you still have to succeed. All right, you've been divorced twice in your 50s. You still have to succeed. Okay, uh, your children aren't talking to you right now. You still have to succeed. Okay, they want to furlough you uh, because of what's going on around you. Okay, you still have to succeed despite the circumstances you are destined to succeed. Don't let any circumstance get in your face and convince you that the circumstance is greater than your Christ. Your circumstance cannot be greater than Christ. Whatever you're going through is not greater than Christ. The only thing you have to do is figure out, is there a name for this? That's what I do. I just ask myself, anytime I'm going through a hard time, can I label this? Can I name this? And once you can name it, then guess what? You can bring the name of Jesus over it. The only thing you have to do is find a name for it. Whatever you're dealing with, name it. And the minute you name it, then contest and then confess and then believe and then behave like that there is a name that is exalted that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Now, if every knee got to bow, that means every circumstance going to have to bow with it. And so when you begin to think in terms of doing well, Developing well, it means that God is going to give you the grace that you need to succeed despite the circumstances. I want you to announce to somebody, I will succeed.
Come on, help me teach tonight. Announce to somebody, I will succeed. Say it. I will succeed. Now, you can go to bed tonight with your mouth shut and not come in agreement with this, and you'll be in the same mess that you were in a week ago. It'll be the same thing because your life follows your mouth. Say it. I will succeed. I have to succeed. Why? Because the Lord put me somewhere between finally and farewell. Finally, I get to go beyond where I've been. Farewell means I get to enter into a new season of success. Are you getting this? Finally, I'm moving beyond where I've been. Farewell, I'm entering into a new season of success. This is the time when I thrive. This is the time I have more than I've ever had before. This is the time I press in like I never pressed in before because somewhere between my finally and my farewell, the Lord has a blessing for the brethren. Now, let me tell you who the brethren are and I'm, I'm out. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Somewhere between the finally and the farewell, you have the brethren. And the Lord is going to bless the brethren between the finally and the farewell. Now, please understand this. And you got to get this somewhere in your notes. The Lord can only move brethren into greater blessings. The Lord can only move brethren into into greater blessings. The Lord can only bring the brethren into a place of greater blessing. What do I mean when I say that? As I define tonight in small context, I'm going to stay in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to show you who the brethren are. Now, generically, we would say the brethren are is whoever saved. If you're saved, we say you're brethren. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah, that's true. Uh, etymologically, that's true. But experientially, not so. Because there are a lot of people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, but they don't operate like brethren. They don't have the blessing of the brethren on them. They're not between the finally and they're not between the farewell. So let me show you who Paul defines as brethren. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Pick me up at verse 17. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you also be of the consolation. So who are the brethren? He says the brethren are those who are partakers. Did you see it? Partakers. Brethren are partakers. They take part. They are in the koinonia. They are in the fellowship. They are on the team. They are working with you on whatever you're working on. They are partners of the sufferings. And that word there is talking about uh, tight places. It's not just talking about painful places. It's talking about tight places. He says they're with you in the tight times. <laughs> and then he says they're with you in the consolation. They're with you in the blessed times. He says, here are the brethren, the brethren who are between the finally and the farewell, the brethren who are going to move beyond where they are so they can enter into a new season of success. They are going to be the ones who are the partakers. Hear me. If you're sitting on the margins of ministry, I can't teach this to you. If you are one of those who kind of in, kind of out, um, this is not for you. Uh, this is for the brethren. And the brethren are not just church attendees. The brethren are the partakers. They're the ones who get in on the team. They don't just stay on the team. They get on the field and they do whatever it takes to get a win. He says, you are the brethren. And the reason I know you're brethren is because you are partakers. You are part of what the Lord is calling me to do. Now, hear me. If you get in on what God is doing, he will put you between your finally and your farewell. If you start doing what God has called you to do, he will put you smack dab between a finally and a farewell. You'll go beyond and you'll move into a new season of success. But you have to learn how to be a partaker. There are so many people in modern Christianity who are the takers. Don't be a taker. 
Be a partaker. Don't be a taker. Be a partaker. You don't want to just be attached. You want to be connected. My daughter Imani taught me years ago, Daddy, there's a difference. I promise you, she told me this in the car one Sunday morning. I was going through a church storm. <laughs> and she knew her daddy was having a hard day that day. And she gave me a piece. Imani told me, she said, Daddy, everybody's, you know, not going to be connected. And you got to know that there's some people who are only attached. And you know the people who are attached, they become the parasites. The people who are attached become those who always want to take something from you, take something from you, take something from you. Hear me. You don't want to be another taker. The body of Christ right now has taken on such a consumerism. It is incredible. And I know during this COVID and because we're doing so much virtual, we're doing so many portals and the technologies at another level that we have just become church surfers. Uh, we have now um, found out which preachers are saying what we want to hear. And now we tapped into them. Uh, we're consumers. If you give me something, then I'll give you something. We become consumers. And that means we're takers. You don't want to be a taker. You want to be a partaker. And when you are a partaker, the Lord puts you between the finally and the farewell. Are you still woke tonight? Now watch this. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 18. For we would not have you, brethren, ignorant. We don't want you ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. He calls them brethren. He calls them brethren. Why? Because they were going through some hard times like he was going through. And he says, just like you went through, I was going through. While I was going through, you were going through. While you were going through, I was going through. And because we were both going through this together, you know what I want to call you? I'm going to call you brethren because you were partakers of the season I was in. And because you were a partaker, it makes you a brethren. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm staying in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you, this is King James, to the wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. What did that mean? He says this. We wanted you, brethren, to understand the work of God's grace. We wanted you to understand what God has done through his grace. Brethren are people who have an appreciation for grace. Where you at? Where you at? If you are brethren, it means you have an appreciation for grace. And when you have an appreciation for grace, you know what? You never become a bitter person. When you have an appreciation for grace, no unforgiveness ever settles in your heart. When you have an appreciation for grace, nobody's offending you every day, all the time. When you have an appreciation for grace, you'll reach out to others. You'll try to bless others. You'll go to the homeless. You'll go to the hungry. You'll go to the last. You'll go to the least. You'll go to the prison. You'll go into a sick room. When you appreciate grace, he says, I want you to understand the grace of God that's been working. Because if you can understand the grace of God, here's what you'll know. Grace is always enough. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, Paul says, I found this out when I was being weak. In my weakest moments, here's what I found out. Grace is always sufficient. When I'm at my lowest, here's what I learned. Grace is enough. Will you just tell somebody grace is enough? Mm, I need you to tell somebody that grace is enough. Say it. Grace is enough. When you get an appreciation for grace, you will appreciate grace because you know grace is always enough. For your worst failure, grace is enough. For your weakest day, grace is enough. For your worst day, grace is enough. Paul said, I want you all to have the revelation of grace. I need you to know. That's mean to wit, to wit like wit and wisdom. I want you to know 
the grace that God has been working in your life because the grace that he's been using in your life is a grace that's always enough. His grace is always sufficient. Now look, look at verse five. I'm in 2 Corinthians 8 and 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own self to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He's describing brethren. Who are these people? Who are these brethren? He said they first gave their own selves to the Lord. Brethren who are somewhere between the finally and the farewell are the ones who have given themselves to the Lord. Have you truly given yourself to the Lord? Have you done it? Are you fully committed to the things of God? Or do you still have some other things that are catching your attention? He says that the brethren of those who first gave themselves to the Lord, and watch this, not only to the Lord, but unto us. You see, brethren are not just vertical. Brethren are not just vertical. Brethren have to also be horizontal. Lord, deliver me from the people who are all into Jesus, but not into us. Did you hear what I just said? All into Jesus, but you're not into us. You and Jesus got a perfect little relationship, but you don't get along with nobody else. <laughs> yeah, you got a tambourine, but you ain't got a handshake. <laughs> you speak in tongues, but you don't speak to nobody. Oh, stop it, Bishop. Be nice. You know what I'm saying? You don't just give yourself to Jesus. You have to also give yourself to us. Paul said the brethren are not just Jesus focused. They're also us included. And so he says they first gave themselves to the Lord, which is proper. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Come on, you can't be a part of this ministry and not know Matthew 6, So we expect them to first give themselves to the Lord, but they don't just give themselves to the Lord. They also gave themselves to us. Who have you given yourself to? Who are you sharing with? Who are you sowing into? Where is the ministry of your generosity focused at? Who in the world feels what you're able to give? Who does that? Who's, who's receiving that right now? Paul said, the brethren gave me that. The brethren understood the grace and then they shared that grace with me. They were kind to me. They didn't just give themselves to the Lord. They also considered me. Paul says, these are the brethren. If you want to be blessed somewhere between your finally and your farewell, appreciate the grace that God has on your life. And then also give yourself, give yourself to God, give yourself to Jesus, and then give yourself to us. Now watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm almost done. Stay with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Go down to verse 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Still in chapter 8. Go to verse 23. And I think most of these are in the King James. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he's my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren, or our brethren. So he just said Titus, right? Mentions Titus. What is Titus to him? Partner and fellow helper. Titus is what? Partner and fellow helper. Who is Titus? He's Paul's partner and fellow helper. He says, not only Titus, but also our brethren. Now he's about to describe the brethren. They are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Are you seeing this? 2 Corinthians 8.23. Who are the brethren? They are the messengers of the churches. The brethren are carrying the message of the church. And the message of the church is Christ and the kingdom. They are messengers of the church. Which means that brethren, true brethren, get the word out. Mm-hmm. I said it. True brethren, get the word out. True brethren are fellow helpers. True brethren are partners. True brethren are messengers of the church. They do not let what is being taught in the church stay in a sanctuary. They don't let what Bishop is teaching on Facebook just stay here. That's why you need to share. Some of you right now need to share. Oops, that's right. Let me share. Push the button. Go ahead and share. Become a fellow helper. Be a partner. 
Do something. Become a messenger of the church. Something is wrong when nobody on your job knows what your pastor taught this week. Oh, he's back. <laughs> What's going on with you? You got to get your mouth open. You are a messenger of the churches. So whatever's being preached and taught in the churches ought to be heard in the streets, ought to be heard in the hallways, ought to be heard in your cubicle. You are brethren. You want the blessing. You want the finally blessing. I know you do. You want to get beyond where you are. You want the farewell blessing. You want to enter into a new season of success. Well, how are you going to do that if you don't want to be a brethren? You have to be a brethren. Messengers of the church. And look at this. The glory of Christ. The glory of Christ. When you are a brethren, you are the glory of Christ. How is that possible? Because Hebrews chapter 2 says the Lord is not ashamed to call us brethren. Did you hear the word of God? The Lord is not ashamed to call us brethren. Think of that. Jesus is the firstborn. Jesus is our elder brother. And the Lord has adopted us into the family. And having adopted us into the family, he has given us the same gene that Jesus had. And now the glory of Christ rests on you. The glory of Christ, his effervescence his brilliance, the shine of his Christ likeness. That's what's on you now. When you are a brethren, you not only are carrying a message, but when you are the brethren, you're carrying the mantle. Did you hear me? You're not just carrying the message of the church. You're carrying the mantle of Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? If you are truly a brother and you're not just carrying the message of the church, you're carrying the mantle of Christ. He is the anointed one. And when you get into his family and you begin to live like he wants you to live as one of the brethren, his brilliance begins to shine out of your life. People begin to see what grace has fulfilled and done in your life. That's why you need to be a brethren. Because when you are a brethren, the Lord puts you between the finally and he puts you behind, he puts you ahead of the farewell. All right, let's close here. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse nine. I'm done. Well, I'm not out of word. I'm out of time. And I just want to introduce this because coming Wednesday, I'm going to get into this lesson. This is not the lesson. It's the introduction. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse nine. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. And when I was present with you and wanted, and I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, listen, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. You don't want to read it? The brethren which came from Macedonia supplied and in all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you and so will I keep myself. Paul says to the Corinthians, when I came to Corinth, I was prepared to do full-time ministry, but you weren't prepared to finance full-time ministry. So the saints that were in Macedonia, they brought me what I needed while I was ministering to you. It's the same thing you all just did for us going into Liberia. We weren't expecting the Liberians to supply everything that we wanted to do for them. And so what did you do? You came alongside of us and brethren, you gave us the supply we needed to travel, to be there and to be generous while we, while we were there. That came from the supply of the brethren. So what do brethren do? Brethren supply ministry. You become the resource for ministry. Brethren are the ones who are going to step up and make sure nothing's missing, nothing's broken, nothing's lacking. When you are a brethren, you will write a check. You're going to cash out something. You're going to do something because you know it takes supply for the message of the church to get forth. You know it takes supply for the glory of Christ to be revealed. Paul said the brethren supplied. Now, here's what I want you to just put it in your notes somewhere, somewhere. I'm a distribution center. 
say it. I'm a distribution center. I'm going to say it because I know it's true about me. I'm a distribution center. I lack not seed. I'm a distribution center. Because the Lord says he gives seed to the sower. And so if you're looking around and you don't see any seed, that's not God's fault. Because God's not breaking his own laws. He said he gives seed to the sower. He's not going to give uh, seed to anybody else. He's only giving seed to the sower. And if you are a sower, look around. God is sending you seed. And why would God send you seed? Because God wants you to be a distribution center. Let me show you something. I'm done. Bishop, you say you're already done. I know, kind of, sort of, you know what I mean. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at this. Because I don't think we read this. <laughs> I know you read Ephesians 4, but I don't think you read this verse. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 28. Ephesians 4, 28. Let him that stole... Still no more. Say amen to that. Who can't say amen to that? Say amen to that. Unless you're a thief. Let him that stole still no more. Amen. But rather let him labor, working with his own hands, the thing that which is good, the thing which is good, your employment, that he may have to give to him that need it. What you say? What that verse say? <laughs> I'll read it again for you. If you've been stealing, stop stealing. But rather, get you a job working with your own hands, the thing that which is good. Here it is, King James Version, that you may have to give to him that needeth. So, are you telling me the Lord gave me a job to do more than just pay my own bills? Mm-hmm. The Lord said he'll have you employed because he wants to make you a distribution center. Deuteronomy 8.18 says the Lord gives you power to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant. Not so you can floss, not so you can ball and shot call. He said he's going to give you the power to prosper because he has a will in the earth and he needs his will underwritten. He needs his will done. He needs his will financed. And who is he going to do it through? He's going to do it through his distribution centers. Who are the distribution centers? The brethren who supply. If you are brethren, and I don't mean generically just because I'm saved, I'm brethren. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about 2 Corinthians brethren. The kind of brethren that made a difference in the Apostle Paul's ministry and helped him to be a gospel globe trotter and to take the gospel of grace to the Gentiles in a way no one else ever has. Paul says, the brethren, finally, farewell. He put the brethren in that space between a finally and a farewell. That's not just a salutation. It's a revelation. Did you hear what I just said? It's not just a salutation. It's a revelation. Get the revelation tonight. The Lord wants to put the brethren between the finally and the farewell. Finally, I'm moving beyond where I've been. Farewell. I'm entering into a new season of success. Is there anyone here tonight who's ready to go beyond where you've been, ready to enter into a new season of success? If you're going to have it, that's the blessing that's on the brethren. But in order to get the blessing of the finally and the farewell, you have to be biblical as a brethren. It's not just enough to claim your salvation. I know you're saved. I'm so glad you're saved. But if you're going to be well developed, you need this word. If you're going to grow in the things of God and be everything he wants you to be, you're going to need a finally and you're going to need a farewell. And if you're going to get the benefits and the privileges of a finally and a farewell, you're going to have to learn how to be a biblical brethren. Now, I'm going to finish up with this verse as the Lord to help us. Come Wednesday night, you don't want to miss it. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11 is the start of me unpacking the revelation that the Lord gave us coming into this new year. He simply told me, give my people this word. Finally, 
finally. I didn't even understand what it meant when he told me. I had to study it out. But now I understand what my finally is. It's God simply saying, I want to move you beyond where you've been, but I need you to get a finally in your psychology. A man can never be more than what he's thinking. And if you can think beyond where you are, you'll get your finally. And if you can imagine new seasons of success, you'll get your farewell because it's time for you to thrive. Despite the circumstances, say it, I will succeed. Well, let me share this testimony with you and then I'm gonna pray for you, okay? So we're in Liberia and um, I had preached that night. It was Friday night and um, the church was just packed. It was standing room only and and more and just more. It was it was too many people to get in the room, people outside. It was just that many people. And uh, in fact, they said that they hadn't seen that kind of attendance in a long, long time. But the Lord just swept over that house that night. And after I finished ministering, um, I didn't have a real unction to lay hands on anyone. I had laid hands, I think, the night before, uh, or the last time I ministered. But I didn't have a strong unction to do personal prophecies, lay hands, release words of wisdom, knowledge. I just didn't have that strong unction on me. It was there, but I didn't have a strong unction. So I waited, and um, I was sitting down after I preached, and the atmosphere was just incredible. I mean, they were around there shouting, running, praising God. I mean, something probably like you haven't seen before. And uh, a woman comes up on to the dais and throws herself down at my feet and clings literally, to the hem of my pants suit and just will not let me go. And I'm wondering who's going to pry her off of me because no one seems to be doing anything. I'm not, I don't feel danger, not really danger, but it's, you know, a little awkward, a little awkward. And she has thrown herself at my feet, holding on to the hem of my pants and um, sobbing, openly, verbally, audibly, sobbing. And so the Lord did give me a word. I laid hands on her and I prayed. The very next night, I didn't see her after that. The very next night, she gets to me. And she begins to describe to me what she was dealing with in her home. She also describes to me that she had a pain that was coming down her, 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 her thigh. I guess that was described her thigh all the way down to her leg. And it, she was in excruciating pain and she just wanted her healing. And that's what pushed her to jump on that platform and to grab a hold of me. She wanted her healing. And the Lord God, gave that sweet woman her healing, and the next night she told me her testimony. The thing that I had prophesied over her was exactly what she was going through. The very thing I prayed was exactly what she needed. She got her miracle. She came back the next night. She talked about what the Lord did in her home that day, and then she told me that the pain that was in her body that had been there for weeks left. In that moment, she went home that night, healed of that plague and went into a home where there was much turmoil and the Lord gave her peace. Now, the Lord didn't do it because I'm Sean Teal. And, you know, I'm not Jesus. So ain't no virtue like that in the hem of my garment. Let's just be honest. But the power of he who wears the garment. 
He who is a healer. He who can heal in places no one else can heal. Malachi said he was the son of righteousness. There's healing in his wings. And the Lord rolls over that woman, that precious woman, and gave her a miracle. And I learned that night. I learned that night. Not that I didn't know, but I just, I needed another lesson. That woman came to the point of her final. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And though I was not laying hands on people, she decided if I wasn't going to lay hands on her, she would lay hands on me. Some point in her head, in her mind, in her heart, she was like a woman with issue of blood. She wasn't going home the same. She came to her finally. And she wanted to go beyond what she had been. She wanted to go beyond what she had been dealing with. And that night she did. And the Lord showed me that because she was determined to get her finally, he gave her a farewell. Are you hearing what the man of God is saying to you tonight? Because she came to her point of finally, the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to let her have a new season of success. I'm going to cause her to thrive. She will have success despite her circumstances. And she did. She was the only miracle. She was not, only, she was not the only miracle. I had one night, may have been the same night, when Brother Patrick almost had to just kind of push me and pull me and prod me. Um, people just lined up. They just lined up. And they knew which door I was going out of because they had figured it out the night before. And they lined up next to that door. And on my way out, I was laying hands, speaking in tongues, praying for people on the way out. They lined up at the door. You won't get those kind of miracles until you come to a finally. You will not fare well until you come to finally. Now, I'm going to pray for somebody tonight. I don't know who you are, but I'm going to pray for you. Because you're at that point. You're at your finally. You're at your finally. And the only thing you need now is to step into your farewell. Are you at your finally? Because if you are, I'm praying for you. Lift your hands. Lift your, if you want me to pray for you right now, lift your hands. Lift those hands. I'm praying for those who have come to your finally. Bishop, I can't have another week like this. I can't have another month like this. I can't keep feeling what I've been feeling. I got to let this go. I need to move beyond. And if I move beyond, I want to move beyond so I can fare well. I want to move beyond because I need to thrive. I've never known what it is to thrive. I've been surviving all of my life. Now I want to thrive. Lift those hands. Precious Jesus. Holy Father. Glorious King and Savior, we come before you now, thanking you for this word and every miracle, wonder, and sign that has accompanied this word. You're a healer. You're a deliverer. You set the captive free. Lord Jesus, you are the anointed one. You remove our burdens and you destroy our yokes. And now, for the glory of your name, do it for your people. Someone has come to the finally in their faith. They're ready to move on. Father, now in the name of Jesus, will you empower them and quicken them by the precious and blessed Holy Spirit. 
Lord Jesus, would you be glory upon them and cause them to be messengers of the church? Will you now raise up the partners, the fellow helpers? Will you now, Father God, bring the brethren into a revelation and an appreciation of grace? And we declare your grace is always enough. Now, Father God, for the pain in that body, I declare you be healed. Now, in the name of Jesus, Father God, for the anxiety that's upon their mind, I command healings in Jesus' name. Where there has been, Father God, sickness and disease to prevail, we break its power and we come against the spirit of every infirmity. And we thank you now that Satan has loosed for the glory of your name. We praise you, Lord Jesus that you have given us power over the enemy. We thank you. We have power over every sickness and disease. And we declare now miracles, healings, wonders to be done among this people. And we say it, Lord, by faith. And we declare it to be finally. And we await now the manifestation of our farewell. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone who agreed said amen. Amen and amen. Come on, praise the Lord where you are. Give the Lord a praise, a glory, and an honor. Thank you, people of God, for being with us tonight. I'm so glad to be back in this venue in front of this camera teaching you tonight. You know I am. Again, uh, tonight was just instruction, introduction. I need you to be with us. This ministry is precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little, there a little, tell somebody no gaps in your knowledge. I teach the way I teach because if you stay with our teaching, it will be a precept upon another precept. It will be a line upon another line. It'll be a here a little and a there a little. And by the time we finish with the series, you'll be walking in revelation. Some of you are still trying to figure out finally. Well, stay with us. Some of you still trying to figure out finally and farewell. <laughs> well, stay with us. This ministry will continue to faithfully exposit, exegete the word of God for your hearing, not so we can be impressive, but so that your faith can rise and you will see demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. Before I leave tonight, if you've never prayed to receive the Lord Jesus, here is the good news of his grace. God has done something through Jesus that no one else could have done. God sent his son into the world because we were condemned. Jesus took on our condemnation. He took on our penalties. And now that he has taken on our penalties, we can be rescued. We can be delivered. We can be saved. Just like a lifeguard would go out and rescue you from drowning waters. Jesus came into the earth to rescue you from the drowning waters of your own sin, your own self, and of course, Satan. And so now, here is the key. Jesus has taught us that he came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Apostle Paul says we can appropriate, apply that truth into our lives by simply believing in our hearts and confessing out of our mouths that God raised Jesus from the dead. Is it that simple? It really is. And you know why it's that simple? Because grace is always enough. So if you never prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart and your life, let's do that right now. I don't want to go to bed with that on my mind. And I sure don't want you to have to go to bed tonight wondering what will happen to me if I don't wake up in the morning. So let's believe God. If you never prayed this prayer, Pray this prayer with me if you are a believer and you need to come on back. Maybe you're in a sliding back position. Come on back. Renew your commitment to God and connect to this ministry so we can feed you the word of God, love on you, pray for you, connect with you, and then serve you and your family. Pray this prayer with me. Dear God in heaven, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. God raised Jesus from the dead. Lord Jesus, step out of heaven. Step into my heart. Change my life. Fill me today with your Holy Spirit. I will live for you. Help me to be all that you have called me to be. 
I want to live for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer and you believed it with all of your heart, I can tell you that the Holy Spirit has already gone to work in you. So what I want you to do is reach out to info at itsthehope.org. Let me connect with you. Let our team connect with you. Let our intercessors connect with you. But let us build you up and let's encourage your new destiny and your new journey in God. People of God, you have been stellar in your giving and support of this ministry. Again, I just look back at what we've been able to do in just the last 30 days. Uh, you came alongside this ministry and you did over and above to make sure that we had everything we needed to minister in Liberia. I appreciate you. We thank the Lord for that. But more than anything, people of God, you don't give to meet a budget, not at the house. We don't give to meet budgets. The Lord meets budgets. That's not our job. But we give to worship. If we hear a word and we appreciate the word we heard, we give. If we're in a worship experience and the Lord is present with us, we give. If we think about his anointing and what Jesus did in the finished work of the cross, we give. We're not motivated because we're trying to get something back. We're not motivated because we're trying to sow our well out of debt. No, we're motivated because we're just a grateful people. We know the grace of God. And when you know the grace of God, you give. So tonight, if this word blessed you, if the house is blessing you, if this ministry in any way is impacting your life, I want you right now, take a moment, do what you do, obey God. We have all kinds of portals and opportunities that you'll be able to give on. Media team will let you know how to do it. Tonight, before you rest, obey God. Do it now. Don't forget about it. Well, you're not going to forget about it because you want to get this word. Say amen. But obey God. Servant Jacob is still on the house call. If you're on the house call with us, you stay with us. Don't you go anywhere. Uh, we'll be with you and we're praying with you and we are praying for you. Don't forget, uh, members of the house, tomorrow night, Monday, it's a car school of ministry. Enough said. It's a car school of ministry. If you want to be tutored and taught, if you want to go to a school of ministry that I believe is about equal to any institute that you would pay tuition for, uh, I think you should be with us at the Issachar School of Ministry. If you want more information, check this Facebook post. Uh, media team will probably post up something, give you some more information, okay? That's for the Issachar School of Ministry. Let's turn this back over to servant Carolyn Jacob, who is on the house call. I'm saying goodnight to you on Facebook, but I'm still with you on the house call. This is your prayer pastor, Bishop Sean Till, thanking you, loving you. We're back. We're back home. And thank you for helping make that happen.